remember those who have passed on this last year. Winona Henniger. Ivan Olson. We remember Ivan Olson. Bernice Estes. We remember Bernice Estes. Charles Stoffergen. We remember you, Charles Stoffergen. So as Terry uh, plays a song, if you want to remember and light a candle in honor of a loved one, feel free to do so then. And those of you that are watching this uh, online, um, do the same. Uh, take a candle and light it and listen to this song and just remember and that me cherish that memory as we honor those, those saints who have gone before. And I went to heaven, and you were there with me. We walked upon the streets of gold beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing, and someone called your name. We turned and saw a young man, and he was smiling as he came. And he said, Friend, you may not know me now. But wait, he used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you'd say a prayer before the class would start. Then one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus to be in my heart. Thank you for giving.
And I'm a product, as I'm sure we all are, of someone investing in our lives. And that's the reason that we're here today. So let us be a reminder of, of, of the investment that people have placed in our lives as we continue on in this service. Well, our scripture reading today comes from Psalms chapter 34, 1 through 10 and verse 22. I bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. I praise the Lord. Let the suffering listen and rejoice. Magnify the Lord with me. Together, let us lift his name up on high. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to God will shine and their faces are never ashamed. The suffering person cried out, the Lord listened and saved him from every trouble. On every side, the Lord's messenger protects those who honor God, and he delivers them. Taste and see how good the Lord is. The one who takes refuge in him is truly happy. And you are the Lord's holy ones. Honor him, because those who honor him don't lack a thing. Even strong young lions go without and get hungry. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The Lord saves his servants' lives, and all those who take refuge in him won't be held responsible for anything. And our sermon text is Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there was a great crowd that no one could number. They are from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And they were standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they wore white robes. And they held palm branches in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving. And honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these people wearing white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he said to me, These people have come out of a great hardship. They have washed their robes and they've been made white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. And they worship him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them. Because the lamb who is in the midst of them on the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. So yes, today is the day we honor those saints of the Lord, those saints of God who have, who have passed on. And we are reminded of this great cloud, cloud of witnesses that joins with us. But when I think about saints, I kind of think about, well, what are the requirements of sainthood? You know, especially in the Catholic Church, they have, you know, St. Peter and, and all these different saints. And, and what is the requirement of, of sainthood. So I actually looked it up. And there really there's there's two main requirements. First is you have to do two verifiable miracles. Like after after your death, they have to be able to verify that you did you did two miracles. And a miracle they describe as an event that goes beyond the forces of nature, which is realized by God, outside of what is normal in the whole of created nature, by the intercession of a servant of God or a blessed individual. Hmm. Well, last time I checked, I haven't done anything like that. I don't think I have any uh, any miracles, so uh, maybe, maybe I'm not quite at, at sainthood level yet. But there's a second one, remember, so, so maybe there's hope. The second is evidence of having led an exemplary, exemplary life of goodness and virtue, worthy of imitation. Hmm. Okay, uh, maybe I'm getting there. Or having died a heroic death and martyrdom, uh, maybe not quite that one. But, or having undergone a major conversion of heart 
where a previous immoral life is abandoned and replaced by one of outstanding holiness. And so notice that nowhere in there does it say sinless perfection. Because there isn't a single one of us who would, who would qualify for that. So sinless perfection isn't in that. But those seem pretty high standards, don't they? But we sing, as we did this morning, a song of the saints of God. And really, I think God's requirements of the saints, when God looks on us, I don't think they're quite that lofty or that high. People who choose to dead hate their life to the Lord. People who live their life that way, I, I think they would qualify when we sing the song of the saints of God. I think that would be, and that would be all of us that are here. We would qualify as the saints of God. Those who have, who have passed on. Because when we talk about the perseverance of the saints, that God will get us through to the end. Despite all these other crazy things that are going on, all these other hardships, or all these other things that God will get us through to the end. And when I read these qualifications, there definitely seems to be a connection with suffering, doesn't it? Suffering seems to stand out in there as one of those things. There's a strong connection for those who suffer for the sake of the gospel and sainthood. But Jesus even tells his disciples, it's not going to be easy for you. There's, there's going to be hardships. In John 16, 33, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have, will have tribulation, but take courage, for I have overcome the world. Yes, things are going to be hard. We're going to suffer. Things are going to be just, you know, and, and sweet smelling rainbows and all these other things our whole life. No, we're going to suffer and go through these things. And Martin Luther, he never really felt worthy as a minister of the Lord. He never felt that he lived up to the standard to be part of God's ministry, especially during the sacraments. When he would preside over the sacraments, he, he had this holy terror, he described it, of, of that God's presence was there and he did not feel worthy of that. So you know how he made himself to where he felt worthy? He would take these leather straps and beat himself with them. Smacked him, beat himself with this thing, and somehow if he beat himself enough, suffered enough pain, that he would somehow become worthy to be a minister of God. And it wasn't until he really got into reading the book of Romans and discovered what the grace of God truly is, that he realized, you know what? <laughs> I'm never going to be worthy on my own. But I don't need to be. Because the one who's inside of me is worthy. Because the one who lives inside of me is worthy, and so therefore I am worthy to be a minister of the gospel. And it's by that grace of God that I'm able to do these things. On my own? No. No, no. It's on our own? No, no. But through the grace of God? Yes. Yes. We can get through that. We can do those things. So we are worthy of, through God's grace, to be this minister. Last week I talked about that we're all part of the priesthood of all believers. That by virtue of our baptism, that we are all ministers of the gospel. And our worthiness of that is because of the grace of God that has been given to us. And a few months ago, uh, my wife Melinda, in, she works in the, the respiratory department at Mercy. And they have a, sometimes they have travelers come through because they get short, short-handed at staff, so they had a traveler come. And this one particular person, her name was Tara, she was actually part of a Carmelite order, so a monastery order. She was part of the Car Carmelites. And if you don't know about them, they're pretty uh, strict. Like, like Those that joined the Carmelite order were like, they intended to be like the best of the best. It was a very strict order. And their, their founder, way back when, Teresa of Avila, had, had this idea that, that they were going to reform the Catholic Church from the inside out, and they would do it through get, living together in, this, in these communities. And so she was a part of this, this convent, and she was in the process of discerning her call, whether or not she wanted to actually take her final vow and become a sister. So that's why she was up here uh, working as a respiratory therapist at, at Mercy. And so her and Melinda got to talk, and they kind of developed a kinship. And one day she, she says to, to Melinda, I have this for you because you remind me of this saint. And so she gave her this card and it's of St. Rose of Lima. And so I just want to, inside it tells a little bit of her story. So I just want to share a little bit of what St. Rose of Lima's story is with you this morning. It says, this lovely flower of sanctity 
The first canonized saint of the New World was born at Lima in 1586. She was christened Isabel, but because of the beauty of her infant face, earned her the title of Rose, which she then went by. At an early age, she got a job to support her impoverished parents and worked for them day and night. And in spite of hardships, her beauty ripened with increasing age and she was much and openly admired. For security, she enrolled herself in the Third Order of St. Dominic, took St. Catherine of Siena as her model, and redoubled her penance. Her cell, in other words, this is where she lived at, at the monastery, was a garden hut, her couch, a box of broken tiles. And under her habit, she wore a hair shirt studded with iron nails while concealed by her veil and a silver crown armed with 90 points encircled her head. And more than once, when she thought of the prospect of a night of torture, a voice said, my cross was yet more painful. And the blessed sacrament seemed almost her only food. Her love for it was intense. And when the Dutch fleet prepared to attack the town, Rose took her place before the tabernacle and wept that she was not worthy to die in its defense. And all her suffering was offered for the conversion of sinners. And the thought of the multitudes in hell was always before her soul. And she died in AD 1617 at the age of 31. So Melinda was kind of like, whoa. <laughs> like, what? She gave me, made me think of this and gave that to her. But man, to think of that, the, the type of, of suffering that she went through to wear a hair shirt with all these nails stuck in it and a, basically a steel crown to sleep on broken tiles and to have nothing. But that was the understanding that, you know what? All this stuff that I'm suffering through is nothing compared to what Jesus did on the cross. And so I'm going to do that in hopes that I can save others. I'm going to do those things in hopes that I can maybe convert those that are, that are in hell, that maybe they'll have a chance. Maybe I can lessen someone's stay in purgatory or something like that. This was the idea behind this suffering for the sake of the gospel. Very strong for them. And in our sermon text, when we get to that point in when it says, those that are standing before the throne, who wear those white robes, it was those who suffered for the sake of the gospel. Those who perhaps were martyred or, or whatever it was, that they had gone through this great tribulation and suffered for the sake of the gospel. But now their robes are washed white by the blood of the Lamb. And that word tribulation that it uses is the same word that we see in John 16, 13, when Jesus promised that you're going to suffer tribulation. And it's a term that describes olives when they put them in the press to make olive oil. So that, that pushing down, that squeezing, that, that pressure that those olives go through to be turned into oil. And so imagine you have a stack of books and they're laid out on their end and you want to be able to pick them up all at once so you grab your hands on either end and you push together and then you can lift them up. That idea, that pressure, that's what it's talking about. So that constant pressure, pushing, squeezing, pressing, force at both ends, that's the idea of tribulation, what it means to suffer for the sake of the gospel, that there's this constant pressure and pain, struggle going on. You know, I've, I don't know if I've ever felt that kind of thing for the, for the sake of the gospel. We are privileged here in America to not have to suffer for that, to not be punished for that. But there are churches, though, that are being burned right now in the U.S. They're being looted, destroyed, and burned. So there are churches in the U.S. that are facing something similar to this. And there are pastors all around the world who live in fear because of the message they preach, because of the people that they lead. They live in fear of their lives and their families because of this gospel message. So there are those around the world that feel this type of thing. The church is being persecuted in other places. And the early church was no exception. You know, we think of the Roman Colosseum. What was that built for? 
It was to torture Christians, right? Throw them to the lions or have them fight against other wild beasts or burn to the stake. I mean, all these horrible things of the early church. And it was the early church father, Tertullian, that said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So despite all those things, despite all those tribulations, those tortures and other things, the church continued to thrive. The church continued to grow. The church continued to build. Even though they maybe had to meet in secret for a while. They maybe had to meet in the catacombs. Or they had to meet in small houses or in other things. The church continued to grow and to thrive. And today, we are here because the church did not die out like that. Amen? We are here because of that. And so we stand on the shoulders of those saints before us. Who did suffer for the sake of the gospel? Who did stand in the face of tribulation whose robes are washed white as we see in this thing we are here as a result of them and we have the freedom to worship God however we choose we have the freedom to, to worship God in a way that we choose and so I am thankful for those saints back when who decided that we needed a church here in Northwood who decided that you know what we need a building they have. And then through the process of that building burning down, then they actually purchased this building here. And then eventually built this wing that we're in right now and continue to carry on so that we here get to extend that. We get to extend that. And so they had this vision to be in ministry together with one another. To be in ministry to the community. And in ministry to all the world. And so we stand on their shoulders today. And we get to proclaim that gospel because of the work and the things that they had done back then. And then those last three verses, last three verses there in Revelation, give us a promise of what's to come. When it talks about those whose robes are washed white in the blood of the Lamb. So this is the reason they are there. They are seated before God's throne. And they worship him day and night in his temple. And the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. Nor sun or scorching heat will beat down on them. Because the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. And he will lead them to the springs of life giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Oh, that sounds beautiful, doesn't it? That sounds so beautiful. But today, we live in this kind of now and, and not yet. We get glimpses of this, of what the kingdom is going to be like. We get glimpses of that when we see uh, wonderful things happen. When we share the love of God with others, we see lives change because of that. But that's not the way everything in the world is, is it? No. So we live in this now and not yet. And the, the now yet, the not yet, won't fully take place until Jesus comes back again. His second coming. When Jesus comes back again, a final victory, then we will fully see the kingdom established here on earth. The restoration of all of creation. But until then, we have to wait. And sometimes life isn't all good. Sometimes there is suffering and tribulation. When I talked about being a saint... I think maybe living through 2020, I think we all qualify for sainthood. <laughs> Amen? I think we all are kind of on that way. We, we know about suffering. We know about tribulations and what it means to deal with, with hurt and loss. Discouragement. All those things. We know what that means. And until the kingdom is fully realized, that's, that's true. But we have our hope. We have our hope that one day, if Christ comes back again, we'll, we'll reestablish that kingdom and it will be fully realized. But until then, we also get a glimpse of that in the sacraments. When we participate in the sacraments, because we believe in the real presence of Christ in the middle of those. So when we when we take the bread and drink of the cup, we believe in the real presence of Christ active right there in that. It's not just all of us here taking the bread. Christ is there with us in that. And not only Christ, we talk about the communion of all the saints. That great cloud of witnesses join with us in that as well. And so those that we, we honor today, those that we remember and honor, they join with us in that sacrament as well. And I tell you what, you can feel that presence. 
you can feel that presence when we reach to that point. And so that will be a part of our communion and liturgy here in a moment. And so for all those saints whose robes are white, I mean, white as the pure snow. You know, that first snowfall of the year where it really covers the ground and everything looks so pristine white. And as the light shines on it, you see little sparkles in it, like little tiny diamonds crushed all throughout the snow. Oh, what a beautiful picture that is. They gleam so white. Those robes gleam so white because they are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Join with us today as we celebrate the Lord's table. So let us join together in our communion liturgy. This is a special liturgy for All Saints Sunday. And so the Lord be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give our thanks and our praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You are the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God of Miriam and Moses, the God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, the God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name as we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. And so the night which Jesus gave himself for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples as he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And do so in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples as he said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant. And my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim this mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and of the cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we named before you today. From Asbury, Lillian Smith, Don Grovall, Wayne Roberts, and Doris Grovall. And in Northwood, Winona Henninger, Ivan Olson, Bernice Estes, and Charles Stoffer. And since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, by your Spirit made us one with Christ and one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.